Hey everybody, it's Derek here. Thanks as always for stopping by. So recently I had done a live stream where I reviewed, I think, four or five books. And this one happened to come up in that list. And there were some things that came up in this book that uh, really warrants its own book review video. So that's what this is. Let me tell you about it. I want to talk about this book called The Northwest is Our Mother by Jean Taie. She is such an impressive person. I'll just read you some of her bio here. She's an Indigenous rights lawyer. Uh, she's fought many battles, actually, at the Supreme Court of Canada. Oh, just a, an incredible background in law. Very, very bright, very, very bright lady. Uh, she kind of reminds me a lot of uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould. Very scholarly and uh, very up on the history. And so, the Northwest is Our Mother is, uh, by the subtitle, you can tell the story of Louis Rail's people, the Métis Nation. Well, I'll sort of walk you through the Coles notes of the book. It is quite a tome. It's quite large and very well sourced, as I say. So it goes from the very beginning where the Northwesterners was uh, basically a, a French version of the Hudson's Bay Company. The Hudson's Bay hadn't landed yet, basically, in Canada. And uh, so there was the Norwesters is what they called them. Of course, with the invasion of Europeans, there were problems, but the French invasion wasn't quite as, as bad, arguably, as the, the British under the Hudson's Bay Company. And so, you know, you got some intermarriage there between the Métis Nation, known back then as the Bois Brûlé. Actually, they still use that name from time to time. That's where you get French and, and Indigenous uh, Métis right? That's where it started off. It's, they called them half-breeds. Of course, that, that word is not uh, acceptable by today's sensitivities, uh, and rightly so. But there's also Anglo-Métis, which she talks about later in the book, uh, as the Hudson's Bay Company comes to be, you know, forced to be reckoned with in the region. And the Métis had such a vast amount of territory, or I should say the Norwesters with the Bras Brûlés, Bois Brûlé, that's hard to say. <laughs> Basically, it covered from, if you can imagine, the southeastern parts of Yukon, south central northwest territories, starting at kind of the eastern end of British Columbia, all the way down sort of this sheet across the Canadian Shield, if you can imagine that. Uh, you know, below the 49th parallel, you know, parts of northern Montana, all the way to the Rust Belt, and then up to the Great Lakes on the other side. Uh, I don't know exactly if it came as far as Toronto, but, you know, somewhere around there, right? This is just the broad stretch of the land that they inhabited. So vast, vast territory. And many Indigenous authors ha have documented, you know, the integrative kind of communal. They were living off the land. They were largely nomadic. They would move to one area. They would kind of not exploit the resources, but they would exhaust the, the resources there and then move on. And that was their pattern for, for who knows, I mean, it disappears into antiquity. It's uh, thousands of years. And so now the Hudson's Bay Company comes in and, you know, some pretty internecine conflicts between uh, many tribes, including the Métis and the Norwesters now, because now Norwesters are considering themselves to be, you know, fairly indigenous themselves. <laughs> they were there long before the British. And uh, and eventually the Norwesters goes out of existence. See, that, that is the company, the Northwest Company, I believe is what it was called. And now the Hudson's Bay Company is the big game in town. And um, there's a great book uh, called The Company by Stephen Bone, B-O-W-N. I don't know if I'm saying that right, Bone Bound. And there's some really interesting uh, charts in that book which show, you know, like how many uh, beaver pelts would buy you a gun, say, or a certain amount of uh, gunpowder or certain tools because, you know, obviously the indigenous and the Métis people were not nearly as advanced as the Europeans in, in technical capacity and things like that. Uh, you know, and so they were very communal. It's like if you needed a gun or you needed a few guns for hunting, they wouldn't, they weren't like, let's go industrialize the harvesting of beaver pelts to get some guns. No, it was like, well, how many do we need? Okay, let's go hunt them. Let's bring them to the Hudson's Bay Company and get our guns. It wasn't, it was, it was always just kind of hand to mouth, but just a dependence on the land, you know, a, a very 
uh, nomadic and uh, pastoral kind of dependence on the land, not this, uh, not this European uh, hostility towards nature. And so she documents all of that as well. And now this is where you get a lot of overlap between what happened with the Palestinians, uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but of course, before then, uh, it's a very similar sort of sui generis status that opens up for the Métis people. And here's how it happens. The Hudson's Bay Company had always had these agreements, which you, with the language barrier, you have to understand there was a very large disconnect between what the Métis understood the agreement was and what it, what it really was. Uh, so Hudson's Bay Company claimed, you know, all of the lands uh, for, for a pittance, you know, <laughs> and the Métis and Indigenous, and this is, goes across all the way to BC, by the way, under the Douglas Treaty and so on, they understood it as land use or like leasing, something along those lines, not, not that they were giving up their title and rights for the pittance that they were offering. So when Confederation starts to become a thing in 1867, this obviously raises a lot of problems because you've got this, all of this hostility understandable hostility because the Brits are trying to pull a fast one by saying, well, we were here and, you know, the Hudson's Bay Company were just claiming what was ours. And that wasn't the nature of those agreements. That's where, you know, a resistance uh, starts to take form. And even though there was no international law that came online, such as what the Palestinians had, it was very similar to that sui generis status that was extended to the Palestinian cause. Uh, if you want to know why I'm thinking along these lines and what I base that on, it's not just something I came up with. I recently read a book called Justice for Some, written by Nora Erekat, and she documents the lawfare, is what she calls it, as opposed to warfare. And basically the legal battles that have been had coming out of the partition at, at the UN in 1947. And so you have this uh, sui generis status for the Palestinians, and uh, operating under what was then known occupation law, uh, you know, which was sort of a terms of engagement and dealing with the, the people there. And so anyway, that's, that's where I draw a lot of the uh, corollary to the earlier conflict, obviously way across the other side of the world in Canada, uh, but very similar kind of concept, you know, the British saying, well, you know, this belongs to us. And uh, the Hudson's Bay Company was uh, always a holding of ours. And so you, you signed away all of your land. And so now you've got all of the same sort of questions coming up. So I found that really, really fascinating, all this history and how Louis Rael navigates all of that and, uh, you know, tries to work out some very tenuous, but you know, uh, workable solutions uh, between the British up until his execution. Oh yeah, and I wanted to mention too, she documents the eradication of smallpox because, you know, I've mentioned other books lately, kind of controversial books uh, like uh, Grave Error by Chris Champion and the 1867 Project where there's this sort of re revisionist drive to present uh, Sir John A. Macdonald as this, you know, saintly type character. And you know, all things being equal, he wasn't the worst guy around. I mean, but he, let's face it, I mean, he was profoundly racist. Yes, you can say that he was a prisoner of his own time period, but, you know, he had a lot of unsavory views and whether or not he was considered by other Europeans and early Canadians to be peaceable with, with the Métis and the Indigenous, the reality is he was horrible. One of the things that these right-wingers often often drive at and, and vaunt about Sir Johnny MacDonald is that, you know, he rescued the Indigenous people with a smallpox vaccination drive. And it's like you look a little further into that, and Jean Taillet really communicates this well. She says that if you didn't take the vaccine, Canada would withhold and in some cases completely suspend treaty annuities. Like, can you imagine that? These are the same people nowadays vaunting Sir Johnny MacDonald for his vaccination drive, but on the other side of their mouth in the modern context of COVID are opposing what Trudeau did, and Trudeau never rolled out anything near as draconian as that. Can you imagine if he had made vaccination a condition of CERB payments, or if you're on medical or disability because you didn't get the vaccination? I mean, that, that raises some pretty extreme human rights issues. I don't care that 
Sir John, A's, John A. Macdonald's vaccination drive was largely effective and, and did save a lot of uh, Métis. It also trampled on a lot of their rights. And we would not brook that kind of nonsense in today's atmosphere. Certainly conservatives wouldn't uh, in their statistical majority. So, <laughs> you know, I really find that logical inconsistency bordering on the hysterical. I'm not going to give away too, too much about this book. I want to also mention something really interesting here about the modern neocolonialism, although there's many definitions for that word. What is brought up in here, though, is what she calls race shifting, uh, or what we actually have common law to address this is called race fraud, where many people who have no connection, no Métis connection or ancestry, are claiming it, uh, and they're they're exploiting the uh, the annuities that they're entitled to, and along with other uh, entitlements. Again, I, I I because I'm irritated with right wingers, I have to bring it back to identity politics because you know how often are they trotting out the leftist has gone all authoritarian and all this, and they play their identity games with gender and sexual orientation, right, and all this nonsense. And it's like, well, what about race shifting? You know, that's been a long, around a lot longer. And has it become a cultural wedge? The war against pronouns has been. I also tie it in with the Palestine thing because what about all the race shifting that goes on that if you have basically someone say so, that they have Jewish ancestry or whatever, you can displace a Palestinian. You can show up, take their property, and Israel will welcome you as a Jew. I mean, how is that not race shifting? How is that uh, acceptable? And they've been getting away with that sort of nonsense for decades. You know, so don't talk to me about identitarian politics on the left. The ones that are really exploiting it, I mean, you've got a, a nuclear superpower in the Middle East playing that, and they've been doing it for decades, and nobody bats an eye to it. But you're going to make this big culture war out of pronouns and, and what have you. I'm just saying, like, let's have some proportionality here, historical proportionality in the context of Palestine and uh, Indigenous peoples of Canada. So those were some sort of highlights that I really enjoyed about this book. It is a big book, but it's so it's so worth it. I think what it nets out around a little over 500 pages after the end notes. And I would recommend it if you have an interest in that. Two things that uh, that caused me to read more Indigenous uh, voices and more about Palestine. The Palestine thing is self-explanatory since October 7th. But all of the questions of indigeneity and uh, colonialism and imperialism coming out of the whole Palestine conflict, I've really tried to get more of these stories and understand, you know, the, the story behind the Basque people, the story behind the Kurds, the story behind Armenians and all these groups, they have this nationalist or, or uh, indigenous identity. And they're just trying to get some acknowledgement. I would say what's going on in Palestine right now has really opened myself up to that side of the argument. Uh, also, it's been sort of this counter narrative in Canada. There are these sort of naysayers about, uh, you know, that Canada wasn't settled with genocide and, and uh, you know, the indigenous peoples. It, it has been a story of cooperation with Europeans. That is such historical revisionism and it needs to be corrected. The record needs to be corrected. So that's why I'm I'm reading people like Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jean Taye, and uh, I intend to read more on the Indian Act. Basically anybody I can I can find that's that's quite credible in this end of uh, the discussion. I thought I wanted to get a good review of that uh, because I've been meaning to review that for a while. Hey everyone, I hope you liked this video. If you want more like the one you just watched, click the suggested video on this screen. Make sure you subscribe, and to connect with me on my other platforms, my handles are linked below in the description, alright? Take care, peeps. Till next time.